Hello and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology Journal Club number 8. I'm your host, Laird Sheldahl, and today I'll be covering not one, but two recent publications in the use of gene therapy to potentially cure the two most common forms of hemophilia. These are the two articles that I'll be covering today. Before I get to the details of the research here, I'd first like to cover a little bit of basic physiology. There are three phases to the formation of a blood clot following injury to a blood vessel. The first phase is the vascular phase. Smooth muscle cells cause vasoconstriction, which limits blood loss. The second phase is the platelet phase. Platelets will stick to newly exposed collagen fibers. This will cause the platelets to become sticky, allowing them to stick to more platelets, which then become sticky, and ultimately this forms a platelet plug. The third phase is the coagulation phase. Activated platelets will trigger the intrinsic pathway, while damaged endothelial cells trigger the extrinsic pathway. These pathways are a series of enzymes activating other enzymes that ultimately converge upon the activation of the molecule fibrin, which forms an insoluble fiber in the bloodstream, trapping red blood cells, forming a stable blood clot. All of the enzymes in these pathways have names like factor 7 and factor 12. We skip a few numbers, but they activate one another like a series of dominoes. Patients with hemophilia A lack factor 8, while patients with hemophilia B lack factor 9. Any gaps in this pathway leads to an inability to form fibrin, and hence incapable of forming a stable blood clot. In the absence of tissue injury, these enzymes are found floating in the bloodstream as inactive molecules, known as zymogens. The activation of one clotting factor will cleave off a bit of the next protein, removing the inhibitory portion, activating the next enzyme, which can then do the same thing to the next one, and so on, until fibrin is formed. A hundred years ago, Patients with hemophilia only lived to be 15 years old on average. Later, blood transfusions were used to deliver the missing clotting factors to the patients in need. Unfortunately, this took the blood from many donors to get enough of that protein. And during the 80s, much of that blood was contaminated with the HIV virus. Many patients with hemophilia wound up contracting HIV or hepatitis C. More recently, advances in recombinant DNA technology have allowed the use of bacteria as little factories to produce the missing proteins. This is, however, very expensive and can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Furthermore, the patient's own immune systems can mount a defense against the recombinant proteins, which then requires the use of even more expensive drugs in treatment. The goals of both experiments I'm presenting today was to deliver the correct DNA to patients with hemophilia so that they would produce all of their own clotting factor proteins themselves. To do this, both groups used a slightly different version of an adeno-associated virus, or AAV. This virus is similar to the adenovirus that causes the common cold, but has a couple of benefits. First, it doesn't cause any disease. Secondly, being a retrovirus, AAV can insert its DNA into the host's DNA. If it did so randomly, this might cause cancer years later, but AAV always inserts its DNA into the same place on chromosome 19. AAV has been successfully used to cure severe combined immunodeficiency, or as those of us who watched the news back in the 80s, frequently called bubble boy disease. It was also the vector used in an experiment to cure OTC deficiency that wound up killing one patient named Jesse Gelsinger. He had been exposed to AAV previously and his immune system had already gone through the primary immune response, generating antibodies to antigens found on AAV. So when researchers used this same virus, to try and insert DNA to cure his disease, his immune system mounted a secondary immune response, generating even more antibodies 
triggering enough inflammation to cause him to go into organ failure. To prevent this, the current researchers made sure that all of their participants did not have high levels of anti-AAV antibodies before undergoing treatment. Next, the two groups used two slightly different versions of AAV. In the group treating hemophilia A, a version known as AAV5 was used, which targets liver cells. Unfortunately, factor 8 was too large to fit within the virus. So the researchers had to chop out a little bit of the DNA, removing the portion that inactivated the protein. Hence, they infected the patient with just the DNA that generated the activated form of factor 8. The other group treating hemophilia B used the standard AAV with the DNA for factor 9 and a promoter that was specific for the liver. Unfortunately, this could not generate enough factor 9 without using a really high dose of the virus in the first place, and this triggered an immune response on the part of the patients. Therefore, the researchers used a mutated version of factor 9, one that is more active than the wild type version, and this meant lower doses of the virus could be used in the first place. So, I've mentioned the liver a couple of times, and that's for a very important reason. It's not enough just to give our patient the DNA for the genes that are defective. Those genes need to be transcribed, translated, and the proteins placed in the proper location, in this case, the bloodstream. Clotting factors can be made by endothelial cells, as well as cells within the liver. By targeting hepatocytes, both groups of researchers got to these cells to start producing the missing clotting factor, which was then dumped into a type of capillary known as a sinusoid. Hepatocytes make a number of proteins found in the blood, including the clotting factors, low-density lipoproteins, and albumin. The reason that other cells would not be effective at getting clotting factors into the blood is that proteins are much too large to diffuse into the bloodstream. The capillaries in the liver, however, are sinusoids, which are leaky. This allows large proteins made by hepatocytes to enter the sinusoids easily, which then connect to a branch of the hepatic vein. Okay, let's summarize. Hemophilia A is caused by a deficiency in clotting factor 8, while hemophilia B is a deficiency in clotting factor 9. Hemophilia A affects four to five times more people than hemophilia B. In the current study, researchers used adeno-associated virus 5, which targets the liver and a few other tissues specifically, to help increase the amount of clotting factor 8 that was dumped into the bloodstream. To treat hemophilia B, researchers used adeno-associated virus with a liver-specific promoter, so that when it did infect the liver, it produced more of the protein. To cram factor 8 into AAV5, the researchers had to cut out a bit of the gene, removing the inhibitory portion, leaving only the activated version of factor 8. For hemophilia B, the researchers used a mutated version of factor 9, one that was more active than the wild type version, and this helped them to reduce the amount of the virus that was used to transfer the DNA in the first place. For hemophilia A, researchers were able to generate 100% of factor 8 activity in 6 out of 7 patients, while for hemophilia B, the researchers were able to generate 33% of factor 9 function for 10 out of 10 patients. So how effective is that 33%? Well, those 10 out of 10 patients used about $200,000 a year less of recombinant factor 9 than they would have otherwise. So that's a very significant result. These results will of course have to be followed up in larger studies. One thing to pay attention to is whether these patients will develop an immune response to these exogenous factor 8 and factor 9 proteins, the way that 20% of current hemophilia patients develop 
in response to recombinant factor VIII and factor IX. Another risk that researchers will be paying attention to is whether the virus incorporates the factor VIII or factor IX genes into locations other than chromosome 19. Inserting the gene for these clotting factors into the middle of another gene might trigger cancer in the future. Lastly is another concern. What about for patients who have already been exposed to adeno-associated virus and have too many antibodies? For these patients, another technology remains possible, using CRISPR to incorporate the gene for factor VIII or factor IX into their own stem cells. The way that CRISPR is used to incorporate Roundup resistance into crops, for instance, might be even cheaper than using a virus to infect cells already found in the human body. Nevertheless, what we have here are two papers describing a potential cure for the two major forms of hemophilia. One treatment might be enough to fix this disease. So thanks again for watching, and I'll hope to see you again soon.